Hollywood, California, Monday, June 21st. The Lux Radio Theater presents Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy in Monsieur Fouquet. Lux presents Hollywood. This program tonight is your program. Since your purchases of Lux toilet soap make the Lux Radio Theater possible. We are happy to bring you Monsieur Beaucaire and its celebrated performers, Leslie Howard, Alyssa Landy, Pedro de Cordoba, and Dennis Green. Also, our guests, Ray Jones, ace portrait photographer of Universal Studios, and Evelyn Key, latest discovery of our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. On behalf of our stars, our guests and sponsors, welcome to the Lux Radio Theater. Before we hear Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy and Monsieur Beaucaire, may I tell you what a famous and beautiful woman has to say about feminine charm, Loretta Young. Men say of her, she has what it takes, all right. Women try to be like her, the biggest compliment of all. Here's what she says. No girl who isn't dainty can hope to be attractive to men. I'll tell you what I've discovered. My own complexion soap, Lux Toilet Soap, is the perfect bath soap. The active lather leaves skin smooth and really fresh, fragrant with a delicate perfume that clings. There couldn't be an easier, more delightful way to protect daintiness. Now there's a tip we're sure thousands of women are going to follow. You couldn't buy a finer soap than Lux Toilet Soap if you paid a dollar a cake. Yet, because so many of you buy it, its price is modest enough for the most careful budget. And now, our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our play tonight presents what almost any member of the diplomatic corps might call an international situation. Relating the romantic adventures of a Frenchman in England. It stars two gentlemen born in London, a native New Yorker, and a lovely lady who first saw the light of day reflected in the canals of Venice. Monsieur Brocaire brought recognition to Booth Tarkington after eight years of literary endeavor had earned him exactly $22.50. Last month, the play figured in the news on the passing of Mrs. Ovid Jameson, sister of the author. Mrs. Jameson it was who took the manuscript of Monsieur Beaucaire to Samuel McClure and persuaded him to publish it. She also convinced Richard Mansfield to star in the play version. Bringing new honors to the title role made famous by Mansfield is Leslie Howard, who, when the World War broke out, left his job as a bank clerk in London to join the British Army. Theatrical entertainments behind the lines gave him the urge to act. He scored with American audiences in a series of play hits on Broadway climaxed with Barclay Square, Animal Kingdom, and Petrified Forest. On the screen, he's duplicated his record of success and is currently starring in Warner Brothers' production, It's Love I'm After. Writer, singer, pianist, linguist, Alyssa Landy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios is among our most versatile performers. Born in Italy of noble blood, she draws upon her background of nobility for her characterization tonight of Lady Mary. Our native New Yorker is Pedro de Cordoba, who makes his third appearance on our stage as Major Molino, while Dennis Green, the English actor recently seen with Mr. Howard in Hamlet, plays Lord Winterset. Now in Hollywood, the sun of this first day of summer drops behind the hills of Santa Monica into the cooling waters of the Pacific. And with its fading light, fade the lights of our theater. Curtain time is here, and our stars make their entrance as the Lux Radio Theater presents Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy in Monsieur Beaucaire with Pedro de Cordoba and Dennis Green. It's a stormy night in the early part of the 18th century. Off the coast of England, a full-rigged brigantine bound for Dover makes slow progress through the heavy seas. On the spray-lashed quarterdeck, Captain Badger, in command of the ship, wraps out his orders. Hail the royals and 
What do you mean by voting round corners like that? You near threw me off my feet. A thousand pardons, monsieur. Who are you and what are you doing on this deck? I was merely taking a breath of air, but I find it rather damp. Come over here in the light. I've never seen you on deck before. No, monsieur. I've been keeping rather close to my cabin. You're a lackey, aren't you? A, uh, a servant would be more correct, monsieur. Well, get below where you belong. Who is your master? He shall hear of your impotence at once. Uh, monsieur, there is some misunderstanding. There certainly is. This impotent scoundrel here knocked me off my feet. Is he your lackey? Why, he... Uh, he's my hairdresser. Hairdresser? Then you should know better than to let him come on this deck. Your name, sir. Monsieur, you do not know... Who... Your name, sir. It's most unfortunate, monsieur, as I do not want my presence aboard to be known. But since you make it imperative, I am the Marquis de Mirepoix. Marquis de Mirepoix, ambassador from France. I trust you will let this remain a secret between us, as I am on a special mission to England. Captain... Uh... Badger, sir. Oh. Captain Badger, and uh, I humbly beg your pardon, Excellency. I had no idea that you were on board. If I had... That a... is more than enough, Captain Badger. Uh, yes, Your Excellency. Uh, good evening to you. <laughs> you have made quite an impression on the captain, Monsieur le Marquis. Your Highness, please. Not here. I am your hairdresser, not your Highness. Don't forget that. You'd better go back to the cabin. I tell you, Your Highness, by the time our Captain Badger lands, it will be known all through England that I am traveling incognito. But is that so terrible? But they know that I am your friend. No, 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 no. They know you are a friend of the Duke d'Orléans. But I am not the Duke d'Orléans here. He is securely locked in his cell in Vincennes. Let him stay there, my friend. No one in England will know of my escape. Francois. Your Highness. Some wine, please. Yes, Your Highness. However, my dear Marquis, I cannot travel further with you. We must part at the end of this crossing. I must travel my way alone. But you cannot do that. I will not hear of it. But you are hearing of it. I shall not be known as your hairdresser, of course. I shall become a man in my own right. A Frenchman seeking, uh, what? A cure in the waters at Bath, that will do. They say that Bath is a gay place at this season. Oh, Your Highness, will you ever become sane again? Never. I shall change my name, of course. I shall be known as Monsieur... Monsieur Beaucaire. Mark the name, friend. Beaucaire. You may hear of it in your travels in England. Your Highness, please, please give up this mad scheme and return to France. To be shut up in prison again? No, no. The Duc d'Orléans is dead. Long live Monsieur Beaucaire. Citizens of Bath, word has come from France that the Duke of Orleans has been imprisoned by the king's order. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. So, did you hear that, Francois? I'm still in prison in Vincennes. Yes, monsieur. It is very interesting. <laughs> oh, very. Shall we continue our walk, monsieur? Yes, yes. I'm delighted with Bath, Francois. I find here a certain... Francois. Monsieur. That lady who is just getting into the carriage. Who is she, do you know? If I'm not mistaken, monsieur, she is Lady Mary Carlyle. And if the boy who polishes your boots at the lodging house is not mistaken, she is followed here in Bath by a crowd of suitors. Oh, she is beautiful. Beautiful. Look, she dropped something. Wait here, Francois. Yes, monsieur. You may drive on, Thomas. Be careful. Uh, very good, my lady. Mademoiselle, wait, wait, please. One moment, Thomas. Mademoiselle. What is it, please? You, you dropped something, mademoiselle. I did? Yeah, a rose. It fell from your bouquet. 
Oh, thank you, monsieur. Uh, it's nothing, mademoiselle. I'd willingly pick them up one by one if you would drop them that way. <laughs> You're very kind. Drive on, Thomas. No, no, wait, wait. You, you wouldn't consider it, I suppose. Consider what? Dropping them one by one. Hardly. The bone ashes, Thomas. Yes, my lady. Bone ashes. Monsieur. <laughs> Monsieur. Hmm? Oh, yes, Francois. I neglected to tell you. Uh, the Duke of Winterset is Lady Mary's most favored admirer. He is very influential in Bath, and not a man to have as an antagonist. <laughs> Francois, you are not only a splendid valet, you are a diplomat as well. Uh, tell me, Francois, what is, uh, what is Beau Nash's? Oh, very fashionable, Your Highness. One goes there to drink the healing waters and to meet one's friends. They're said to be gambling also if... If one is interested. Oh, I am very interested. But in more than the gambling. <laughs> but really, sir, since you've returned to Bath this season, you've told us nothing about the Duke d'Orléans. Why was he in prison? You must have heard some news when you were in Versailles, Captain Badger. I don't know more anything about it than you do, Miss Lucy. The story has it that King Louis of France arranged a marriage between his cousin, the Duc d'Orléans, and the Princess Henrietta. Well, we know all that, but what happened, Captain Badger? Well, Miss Charlotte, the princess, it seems, was willing enough, but the young Duke refused the match. Oh, but why? Oh, there was some nonsense about not marrying unless there was true love. On both sides. Oh, how romantic. And the king kept him into prison for that? That's what they say. Of course, the duke is, uh, stupid, uh, to say the least. Uh, Miss Lucy. Oh, here is Major Molyneux. Perhaps he'll know something about the duke. Uh, Miss Lucy, I've been looking for you. We want some information about the Duke d'Orléans. Tell us what he's like, Major Molyneux. I've never seen him. Uh, but they say he's the best actor in Versailles. He speaks English well, loves cards and the dice, and fortune favors him in both. He's the finest swordsman in France, is gay, debonair, and uh, uh, that's all I know. Ah, oh, but what does he look like? Why not ask a Frenchman? I will. There's a Frenchman stopping here at Bath, Monsieur Beaucaire. We'll find out from him. He's sure to know. Monsieur Beaucaire? Yes, who is this Monsieur Beaucaire? I've heard nothing but Monsieur Beaucaire ever since I've come from France. He seems to have completely captivated the ladies. He's been coming here to Bow Nash's every evening for a week. <laughs> I do believe he's looking for someone. And he's asked about my cousin twice. What's that, Miss Lucy? You mean he's asked after Lady Mary? Yes, it is strange. She assures me that she doesn't know him. Mm, the Duke of Wintershed said she'll hear of this. He's jealous of her even now. And if this Frenchman is trying to... Uh... Yeah, he is now, Captain. Um, good evening, Mr. Beaucaire. Ah, Miss Lucy, Miss Charlotte. May I present these gentlemen, Major Molyneux? Uh, your servant, sir. Your servant. And Captain Badger, Mr. Beaucaire. Monsieur, haven't we met uh, before? I, uh, I don't believe so, Captain Badger. I'm sure I would have remembered it. But there's something about you that... Uh, perhaps I'm mistaken. Yes, perhaps. Mr. Beaucaire, have you ever seen the Duke d'Orléans? I... What is it you say? Have you ever seen the Duke d'Orléans? I beg you to forgive me, but that gentleman, the Duke d'Orléans, he has made a great deal of trouble for me in my life. <gasps> is it possible? You mean he is your enemy? My very worst enemy. I ask you to forgive me, but I, I'd rather not speak of him. Just tell us that he's very handsome, monsieur. No, I've heard he behaves very badly. I can tell you nothing, mademoiselle. If you will excuse me, please. I was about to take a stroll in the garden. Well, of course, monsieur. Really, I'm all at Monsieur Beaucaire. Uh, Monsieur Beaucaire. Yes, Major Molyneux. Uh, forgive me for following you out here, but I must speak to you at once. If I can serve you. I... You can, monsieur. You are a Frenchman. Well? You may know, monsieur, that I serve the English king and that I've recently come from the court of France. Aha. Uh -huh. I take you to be a man of honor. And I'm trusting you. Uh, to be frank, we have private information that the Duke d'Orléans has escaped from prison in Vincennes. No, the miserable wretch. Why did he run away? I've heard the food is excellent in that prison. <laughs> uh, uh, the French ambassador happens to be a good friend of the Duke. 
and the young man persuaded him to take him to England in his suite. I believe as a hairdresser. Oh, oh, did you call Leon a hairdresser? Not really. How, how many people know this? In France, the king, the governor of Vincennes, and the English ambassador. In England, Monsieur de Mirepoix, you and I. And uh, you want to arrest the poor little duke for the king of France? Uh, no, monsieur. He has left Monsieur de Mirepoix, and it is my business to find him and protect him. If any harm befell him here, it might bring about serious consequences between England and France. You can see that. Oh, he is important, this, this young man. I, I appeal to you in despair, monsieur. If you know of him, if you can give me an idea of him, I beg that you will. Yes. Yes, I think it is time for another glass of the waters, monsieur. Then you're determined not to help me. I do not meddle in important secret matters. Your caution is commendable. There's nothing more dangerous than to possess a secret. Ah, yes, monsieur, there is. There is one thing more dangerous. A woman. Uh, true, <laughs> they go together. No, 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 they do not. You cannot have them both at the same time. Uh, some women... Monsieur, there's but one woman in all the world. There she is over there by the fountain, the lady with the roses. You mean Lady Mary? The Lady Mary, yes. You will present me, monsieur. A what? I shall consider that a great favor. I shall ask her permission to present you. But why should she refuse? Because she is a great lady, monsieur. And if you'll forgive me... I am not a great gentleman. Very well, monsieur. I shall have to present myself. Adieu. Lady Mary. Uh, I'm afraid we've not met, monsieur. But we have. Have you forgotten the rose? Rose? I've come to ask a favor of you tonight. Once I returned your rose to you, now I ask, I beg that you will give me one. One that has not just fallen from your hand unnoticed. I'm sorry, monsieur, but... Mademoiselle, may I tell you something? Something just as it is in my heart. Is there room for anything there with all the pictures it must carry? Pictures? Of all the ladies of the French court. <laughs> We've never been introduced, Monsieur Beaucaire. But I have heard something of you. There was in my heart till this night the picture of one woman. I've carried it with me for years. Now it is no longer a picture, but a reality. You. <laughs> Monsieur. Oh, you laugh at my prayers, mademoiselle. But better the laughter of a goddess than the smile of a mere woman. Possibly you prefer the laughter of a goddess to, uh, to... To uh, what, mademoiselle? To a mere rose from the hand of a woman. I'm your captive, Lady Mary. If I give it to you, it will mean nothing. To you, nothing. To me. Well, give it to me and tell the King of England to send all his great army to get it back again. And what then? Then? Then I'll run away. But the King's army, it will not get the flower. Monsieur Beaucaire. If I give you a rose... You shall take for an answering gift all a man's soul. Monsieur, <laughs> I'm afraid I must imitate you. You shall represent the armies of the English king, and I, I shall run away. <laughs> Mademoiselle. Lady Mary. Ah, good evening, Winterfax. I've been looking for you. This, uh, this is Monsieur Beaucaire. Monsieur, the Duke of Winterfax. Your servant, Monsieur. I was not aware that you were acquainted with Lady Mary. I took the liberty of making myself known to her. It was a liberty. Oh? Please. Monsieur Beaucaire was once kind enough to pick up a rose I had dropped. That is hardly sufficient reason for his forcing himself upon you. Or is the standard of good manners slightly lower at the French court? Our manners at the French court, monsieur, are governed by one simple rule. Be always courteous. For you never know whom you might be insulting. Perhaps I know more than you think. You know what, monsieur? Captain Badger. Badger! You'll know very soon, monsieur Beaucaire. Did you call me, my lord? Badger, you told me you recognized this man. I did, my lord. I couldn't place him at first, but I'm quite sure now. I've taken it upon myself to inform the rest of the company. Yes, What's the matter here? One moment, Major Molyneux. Perhaps you'll tell me what this is all about, Winterset. I will. As you know, my lady, these rooms are for ladies and gentlemen only. I desire you to look carefully at this person. This person who calls himself Monsieur Beaucaire. This is a strange request. There is an explanation. I have come to expel this fellow from the rooms publicly. May I ask this stupid question? Why, Monsieur? You come here and thrust yourself among people of fashion and birth, do you? What were you born that you do this? 
Were you born a gentleman? No, monsieur. I was born a baby. <laughs> In all my life, I have never seen one baby who was a gentleman. Have your jokes while you may, monsieur. For hereafter, this place will be locked to you. Ladies and gentlemen, this man sailed from France with Captain Badger. He's nothing but a hairdresser for the Marquis de Mirepoix. A hairdresser? You, monsieur, you... I am a hairdresser, monsieur Major Molyneux. Is this true, monsieur? Quite true, mademoiselle. Do you stand against me, too? There is little else I can do. Excuse me, please. Of course. Now, get out. And if you ever show your face here again, you'll, you'll be thrown into jail and lashed by a fellow groom. Why not make the degradation perfect and say lashed by you, my dear duke? You will leave Bath before night, you hear? No, I shall not leave Bath. But if one must be a gentleman to gamble in these rooms, then I shall bow to your higher birth. But all gentlemen are welcome to my apartment, where I will be pleased to engage them with the dice or the cards. And always fair, monsieur, night or day for any stake. For a shilling, a thousand pounds, or ten thousand. With the cards or the dice. Or, if the Duke of Winterset prefers, with the small sword. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. And now we're going to take you for just a moment over to Universal Studios, where a party of visitors is being shown around. They've walked down real streets lined with stores and tenements, with chateaus and brownstone houses. They've gasped at a big moored ferry boat that turns out when you walk a little farther to be only half a ferry boat standing on dry land. Water and wave effects to be artificially produced when the need arises. Now our visitors are in one of the huge studio buildings. The official guide is speaking. And this is the star's dressing room, at present being used by Diana Durbin. Oh, it's thrilling to actually see this room. Look at the dressing table, light all around it. What a test for complexion. Well, Jane, everybody knows that movie stars have to be especially careful of their complexion. And here's the Lux toilet soap she uses. Big as life. Movie stars have learned through long experience that Lux toilet soap is an ideal protection against the choked pores that cause cosmetic skin. If you're bothered by tiny blemishes, dullness, and large pores, better begin today to follow this simple rule. Before you put on fresh makeup, Always, before you go to bed, use Lux Toilet Soap. When you begin to use this soap, you'll say to yourself, I understand now why nine out of ten screen stars use it. Back now to Mr. DeMille. We continue the story of Monsieur Beaucaire, starring Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy. Two weeks have passed since Beaucaire was exposed as a hairdresser before the Society of Bath. But still, he's not given up hope of winning Lady Mary's attentions. He's remained at the watering place, where he's opened a gaming house. It's morning, and in the reception room, we find Beaucaire with Major Molyneux, who has just entered. Uh, Your Highness. Ah, my friend, my very good friend. I come to serve you, if I must, but first to remonstrate. Remonstrate? To beg that you declare yourself as the Duke d'Orléans. My friend, there is no use. You alone have found me out. But still, I make my little plan. Oh, your plans will break your heart if someone doesn't kill you before that. You're throwing your heart away upon a coronet, a book of heraldry. I tell you, Lady Mary is a stone. Stone to any but a duke. Well, I'm going to be a duke. Eh? Perhaps even tonight. What? Listen, my friend. You say I throw my heart away upon a stone. You say she is a coronet and a book of heraldry. But I say she is a woman, and a woman with a heart. Oh. Someday you will know I speak the truth. I will prove it to you and to myself. If you would only tell her who you really are. No, no, no. I've told you that I still make my little plans. Tonight, some of the high-born gentlemen of the town come to try their luck with the cards. Among them, my lord Winterset. Winterset? Coming here? Oh, he's been coming for a week. As much as he despises me, he loves the money I have permitted him to win. Tonight he comes again. To cheat, as usual. Cheat? He always cheats. But this time I plan to catch him at it. He'll be very angry, my friend. But so will I. There will be words. Perhaps even a fight. Oh, no. Oh, yes, a fight. Oh, Your Highness, you must My friend, listen. In all my years, they have never allowed me to have a fight. Think of that. Not one little fight. 
Of course, I, I don't wish to hurt anybody, and I haven't any bad feeling, but I, I don't think all the money I paid out for fencing lessons should be thrown away. Look, my friend, is it so terrible of me to want just one little fight? But, Your Highness, what has this to do with your plan? You said yes, that... yes, yes, we, should, we shall come to that. The Duke of Winterset and I shall play in the private room upstairs, alone, of course. You will wait in the ante room until you hear me cough. Like this. <laughs> then you will send Francois to interrupt the game. But, but why, Your Highness? <laughs> you will see, my friend. Tonight you will help me to catch me, Lord, the Duke, cheating at cards. Well, well, you win again, my Lord Winter said. Almost 500 pounds. Shuffle the cards. You talk as though 500 pounds were a fortune. It's hardly worth the trouble of sneaking to this dirty thieves' den. Then why do you come, my lord? Why do any of us come here? Certainly not for the joy of being in your company, Beaucaire. Oh, no, 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 not for that. You would like to be rid of my company. But you would also like to win my money. You have won much, monsieur. But tonight, I think we play for something else. What are you talking about? For a little red rose, monsieur. What? <laughs> Will monsieur be seated? Come in. Well, Francois. Monsieur, there is a gentleman here to see you. Ah, yes, yes. If my lord will excuse me, I will see him in the entrance. I'll return in a few minutes. Oh, well, don't be long. I'm going to Lady Relevant's party later, and I haven't any time to wait. I know, monsieur. Major Molino. Yeah, your highness. I've given the duke time enough to set the cards. Go out on the balcony and enter the card room through the window. Stay behind the curtains there. I want a witness. <laughs> he has worn wide sleeves, so he may keep a card or so in readiness. Well, we shall see. This is foolish, Your Highness. Will you please to stop saying that? Go along now. I'll return to the room. Well, is Monsieur the Duke ready? Quite ready. And I think, since you were talking of stakes a while ago, that we should raise the stakes tonight. Raise the stakes? You want to ruin me? I say three cuts of the cards and triple the stakes. Oh. Are you afraid? <laughs> I think I'm always afraid, monsieur. I'm afraid of the dark, but uh, that is what makes it fun. Life would be dull if one were not a coward. Then what do you say if we triple the stakes again? What? Triple what we have already tripled? You said that was the fun of life. You go back on your word? No, monsieur. Then draw a card. Of course. Very bad. Well, what is it? The ten. Your draw, monsieur. What did I do with my snuff box? The ace. The ace, by gad, I drew the ace. That's fortunate, monsieur, except that you drew it from your sleeve instead of the deck. What? May I see the other card you have concealed there? What are you talking... Take yes. your hands off me. Here they are. Thank you, monsieur. Why, you dirty... Only the king and the other ace. I fear you lack ambition, monsieur. I'm very disappointed in you. Everyone will be. Why, you... Do you dream that anyone in Bath would take your word against mine? Major... Your word is not important now, Your Grace. Major Molina. Well, Beaucaire, what's your price? This is my price, monsieur. You are going to take me to the Lady Relatons tonight. You're going to present me there and introduce me to the Lady Mary. Why, you impudent... Nobody will question monsieur's guests, so we will go together and to other balls later. I won't do it. Monsieur, you must do it. They won't accept you there. You forget that the Lady Mary knows who you are. A hairdresser. A barber. <laughs> the barber's throat shall be cut with his own razor. <laughs> I must choose some new disguise and rank, eh? So no one shall know me. Shall I be a marquis with goatee? Vicomte with whiskers at the side? No, 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 no. Out of deference to monsieur, I too will be a duke. Say, the duke de... The duke de Chateaurien. I shall assassinate my mustache, and with my hair done a la mode, even you will not know me, my lord. And do you fancy... I this? fancy, monsieur, that I shall meet my dream. Well, what is your answer? Well, there's nothing for me to do but accept your term. That is too good of you. Major, have I your word that this will be carried no farther? You have my word. Very well. You shall go to the ball with me tonight. But let me warn you. I shall not be saddled with you any longer. All I require... Mille pardon. All I beg of monsieur is one night's introduction. After that, I shall not need monsieur. But you may need a steady hand and sword, barber. My friend. Perhaps I shall have my fight after all. My one little fight. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, Major, do you think I look like a duke? It's a miracle, Your Highness. You're as different as night from day. Not like Monsieur Beaucaire? Uh, no more than I am. Good. The barber has shaved himself, Major. <laughs> My poor mustachio is gone for good, I fear. <laughs> ah, what a man will not do for love. I've often wondered at it, Monsieur. Has His Grace introduced you to the Lady Mary? No, not yet. He delays as long as possible, I think. But she's here. I've seen her. He has little taste for the job, I warrant. I'm impatient for the delay, and yet thankful to think, my friend. What if she should recognize me? I have no fear of that. I'd hardly know you myself. Those clothes, your hair. There's a whole new bearing about you. <laughs> I don't wonder they call you the best actor in Paris, monsieur. Oh, my friend, you give me strength. <laughs> Aha! The Duke of Winterset. Well, Barbara. I've been waiting, monsieur. I've just been reassured by the major. And I'm prepared now to meet the lady. She isn't here. Your eyes go weak, monsieur. She sits over there by the door. I, I promised you an introduction. No more. I cannot well be satisfied with less. Shall we go? Your pardon, monsieur. Certainly, monsieur. Well, come along, barber. My only hope is that she'll know you for what you are. That is my risk, monsieur. Oh, uh, Lady Mary. Yes, Winterset? May I have leave, my lady, to present a friend of mine? A very old friend, my lady. Oh, I should never have asked to be presented. Yes? He has recently come from France, and uh, he is the Duke de Chateaubriand. I'm honored, monsieur. Thank you, my lady. The honor is mine. May I escort you to the balcony, Lady Mary? Monsieur, have you forgotten? You were on your way to see Lady Relaton. What? Distinctly, I heard you say so, monsieur. Very distinctly. Oh, uh... Yes, 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 of course. Well, excuse me, milady. I shall return in just a few minutes. Well, may I escort you to the balcony, Lady Mary? Thank you, monsieur. The Duc de Chateaurien? Uh, yes, yes, milady, yes. Yeah. You have uh, you have heard of me, perhaps? I'm sorry, monsieur, but I have not. Ah, but you will, milady. You will. <laughs> This is Duke de Chateaurien, whom they, we met at Lady Relaton. Isn't he fascinating? I wonder who he's building. Now, honey, lately, Duke de Chateaurien, and they say Lady Mary is completely captivated by him. But they met only a week ago at Lady Relaton. Yes, I know, that's what I can't understand. Yeah. I don't know what <laughs> The Duke of Winterset was the one who presented him last week. And now he's burning with jealousy. Yes. It's too amusing. <laughs> there he goes, out into the garden with her. I see him, Badger? Aye, under favor, my lord, Winterset. I don't like that Frenchman. Like him? Your Grace. Lackey, another glass here. Yes, Your Grace. Is that the way you feel toward him? I hate him. Then why did you introduce him at Lady Relaton? Why? It was no fault of mine. The knave did me a scurvy turn once. But I've done paying for it. I've done, I say. Your Grace, people are looking. Let them look. Where are you going? Into the garden. Your Grace, come back. Come back, Your Grace. Shall we sit here, Lady Mary? You asked if I would like to walk in the garden, monsieur. And you said yes. Well, we have walked. Now I make another request. May we uh, stop walking, please? If you wish. Lady Mary, this whole week have I known you. And only once have I seen you alone. Has there been any reason to see me alone? The very best of reasons. The first time to tell you that you are the most charming, the most gracious, the most beautiful of all ladies. And now? And now... Now, to repeat it all over again. Not with the very same words, monsieur. With the same words, yes. <laughs> well, that is stupid, is it not? But cannot... Men cannot all be poets, nor all poets suitors. And even if I were the best of bards, my tongue would still trip and my rhyme sound out of key when I try to speak of you, my lady. Your tongue does not trip, monsieur. It hints rather that you're adept at making pretty speeches. Ah, that only proves the inspiration. We English women have come to believe the too great smoothness of speech indicates the artist rather than your true... Uh... Your true lover, mademoiselle. Your name in France, we say it Marie. The English way, I think, is so much sweeter. They say Mary. Monsieur. Yes, the English way is so much better. 
Mary. Monsieur, you, you, you say my name? As if it were a prayer. It is a prayer to me. A prayer that I may call you by that name often. I, I think we should go in. We're forgetting the guests. Must we go in? It would be better. Do you doubt me, milady? Do you doubt my love for you? Is that why you turn from me? That which is so near heaven must ever wear the snow. It is so high. But I'd rather the snow were not so cold toward me. Look at me, Mary. No, please. Why? Why, Mary? I'm afraid that you would see that toward you all the chill has gone from the snow. Long, long ago. Oh, Mary, my beautiful. What was that? I heard nothing. There's a man there. A man hidden in the shrubbery. You overhear a Frenchman making love. The Duke of Winterset. A neat lesson, Frenchman. You are adept at fancy speeches. Winterset, please. It is nothing, mademoiselle. His lordship has lingered too long over the bottle. It has given him false courage. Draw your sword. I wear no sword here. Then the worst luck for you. No, no. Ah. The wine has unsteadied your hand, my lord. Are you hurt, monsieur? Just a scratch on the shoulder. Oh. Stand away and let me run him through. You can't murder the duke in cold blood. The duke. <laughs> my lord Winterset, what has happened? The Duke of Winterset has wounded an unarmed man. Lady Mary, I would tell you, this so-called Duke is a... Silence! You saw a gentleman. If he dies under your whip, you saw the villain struck me. Do your duty and be quick. Come Come, with me. One moment, please. Lady Mary, a thousand pardons to be the cause of such a melee in your presence. You... You are hurt, Mr. Lady Mary. You coward. I will but avenge you, ma'am. Avenge me? Who is this man? The Duke de Chateaurien. Look at him. That's all I ask. Look closely. And remember the day he was expelled from Beau Nash's. Yes. Yes, look, mademoiselle. Look at me and remember Monsieur Beaucaire. I was about to tell you, mademoiselle. Wait. You believe me? It seems you... Waited too long. Let me through. Let me through here. Ah, Major Molyneux, my friend, your arm, please. What has happened? The Duke of Winterset has pricked my shoulder. It is nothing. He lingered in the shrubbery until. Enough of this. Take him away. You fool. My friend, this is for me. One week from tonight, I shall meet these gentlemen in the assembly rooms. You shall be my second. Monsieur, you're hurt. Take him away. I shall leave myself. But I promise you, Lord Winterset, that when we meet one week from tonight, you will again be found in the shrubbery. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue shortly with Monsieur Beaucaire. A few weeks ago, a member of my staff brought a young girl to my office who had recently come to Hollywood from her home in Georgia. Her name is Evelyn Keyes. Like thousands before her, she came without knowing anyone in the films, without any experience as an actress, but I thought I saw in her the essentials of a sensational new star. Though she's never faced a picture camera, she'll have an important part in my next film, The Buccaneer. And she's the first actress in more than ten years whom I've placed under personal contract. In 25 years, I've made three mistakes in choosing star material. She may be my fourth. I can't predict. I can only guide her. Her success from now on rests with her and with picture audiences. For the present, let's hear from Miss Keyes. I'm just beginning to realize the tremendous opportunity you're giving me, Mr. DeMille. And the more I realize it, the more frightened I become. Frightened of me? You and everyone else in Hollywood. Your name has been magic to me since I was six years old. I know that I have a great deal to learn. It's so much, in fact, that I can't understand what made you give me a chance. Maybe you'll tell me now. Well, some of the reasons may amuse you. You impressed me because your voice wasn't squeaky, you dressed simply, acted like a lady, and because I saw in your face a good screen on which to watch the emotions of life pass by. When you gave me that lesson in diction the time I was introduced to you, I thought at first you were just making fun of me. Why? Because I asked you to recite Peter Piper the Pepper Picker? Yes, I guess so. (laughs) 
Well, that little piece of literature, Evelyn, is one of the finest tests of diction I know. I can see that now. And I've learned it by heart. Would you like to hear me? I would if you do it well. Peter Piper the pepper picker picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers did Peter Piper the pepper picker pick. If Peter Piper the pepper picker picked a peck of pickled peppers, where is the peck of pickled peppers that Peter Piper the pepper picker picked? <laughs> <laughs> not bad, Evelyn, not bad. As a beginner, I think the audience would be interested in your daily routine. Well, I live at the studio club. That's a residence club for about a hundred girls like me who are connected with pictures but don't make much money. A lot of the famous stars helped organize it, and Mrs. DeMille is one of the directors. It's near Paramount, so I can walk to work. Stars like Jesu Pitts and Maureen O'Sullivan used to live there, too. I go to the gymnasium every day, and every other day I study with Oliver Hensdell at Paramount, learning acting and diction. Mr. Hensdell is teaching me a wide variety of characterizations. These are excerpts from different plays. Then I act them out for him with one or two other actors who are also beginners. I still have a Georgia drawl that I'm trying to overcome. Right now, Mr. Hensdell is teaching me proper vowel sounds. It may sound a little silly, but I have to repeat such lines for him as How now, brown cow, and mumbo jumbo, god of the Congo. I'm also learning to recite the raven. What in Hollywood has impressed you most? The huge studios, the handsome actors, the climate, or what? I'm afraid what's impressed me most of all are the little houses sitting up all over the hills that surround Hollywood. I haven't met any big stars, I've never been to the Trocadero, and I haven't any boyfriends yet. Of course, the biggest thrill I had was getting that contract from you. Next to that, though, is my being here in the Lux Radio Theater on a program that I used to listen to back home when Hollywood was just a dream. But I didn't have to be told how good Lux Toilet Soap is. I've used it ever since I was a little girl. I was delighted to find that it's the official soap at Paramount Studios, too, and to hear that it's preferred by practically every star in pictures. I knew that someday I'd get to Hollywood, and I knew that complexion would mean a lot. So I've given mine the best care in the world, and that's Lux Toilet Soap. Lux complexions do help, Evelyn. But what would you have done if you'd had to keep going from one casting office to another, and never the sign of a job? Well, that was something I just refused to think about, Mr. DeMille. My greatest hope is that I'll justify the confidence you've placed in me, and I've never met it more than in saying thank you to you now. Good night, Stalet. Back to Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy and Monsieur Beaucaire. It's the night of the promised meeting between Monsieur Beaucaire and the Duke of Winterset. Beaucaire, fully recovered from his wound, is in his room, dressing for the occasion. Francois assists him. Our very best waistcoat, Francois. We must make a good impression at the assembly rooms tonight. Yes, Your Highness. I have had it widened at the shoulder. It will be more comfortable over the bandage. Splendid. My arm must be free tonight, Francois. Free for the sword or to hold me, lady. You are really going to see it through, Your Highness? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. They say the Duke of Winterset is the finest swordsman in the three kingdoms. Perhaps, but not in the four. No, you can't dissuade me, Francois. Tonight I have my little fight. The first fight of my life. Praise God, it may not be your last. <laughs> Not a sign of him here. Past nine o'clock, and Monsieur the Barber doesn't dare to show his face. <laughs> I've heard that the Marquis de Mirepoix has just arrived in Bath. No doubt Monsieur Beaucaire has resumed his former position to His Excellency and can't get the evening off. <laughs> well, Lady Mary has just come in. Your pardon, gentlemen. Lady Mary. My dear Duke. May I have the honor of accompanying you to the assembly room? Please, not yet. There's so many people in there. Are you faint, ma'am? I'm tired, Winterset. Tired of being stared at. Ever since that night, I see them looking at me, watching, laughing. There is one way of stopping their idle tongues, ma'am. And that is? Allow me to announce that you will shortly become the Duchess of Winterset. It will save appearances. Appearances. We waste our souls for appearances. We sell our realities for them. We paint pictures of ourselves, smiling always, and use our heart's blood for the pigments. Ma'am? I'm sorry. I am tired. It may be unbecoming to remind you, but you owe me at least some slight consideration. For saving me from the impostor? Yes. I owe you all that gratitude can give. 
And I won't shrink from payment of my debt. Then I may announce it. If you wish it. Mary. Your pardon, ma'am. Yes, Major Molyneux. Uh, your cousin, Miss Lucy, asks if she may see you in the West Room at once, please. My cousin Lucy, is there something wrong? Oh, I think not, ma'am. But she wishes to see you alone. Thank you, Major. Excuse me. Lucy, Lucy, where are you? May I lock the door, Lady Mary? You? I'd rather no one interrupted us for a while. Major Molyneux said my cousin was here. Yes, a shameful ruse, Lady Mary. But I'm the one responsible for it. I had to see you alone. I had to speak to you. I'm not interested in what you have to say, monsieur. We heard it all a week ago. I said nothing then, mademoiselle. I had not the strength. You, your shoulder. Yes, I'd been stung by a wasp. It was nothing, but the sky went round and the moon danced on the earth. I didn't wish the wasp to see that he had stung me, so I, I said only what I had the strength to say. Then you're not an imposter. Mademoiselle, I am. But is that the end of everything? Have you no faith in romance? You talk of romance now? Mademoiselle, if you had known that I was just an imposter, if I had told you that just Monsieur Beaucaire, with the heart of a lackey, was asking for one rose, would you have let me walk by your side there in the moonlight? Mademoiselle, if you had known that this Beaucaire was honest, though of peasant birth, would you... It is intolerable. But live men are just names. You put me on the defensive when it's really you who should be. Aye, mademoiselle. Names, what are they to me? I've lived for them all my life. Names, they are shadows. They are not real. Do you need to tell me that? This week has taught me that names are only toys. Do you suppose I can... I was proud of it. Proud because I thought you an honorable gentleman. And it was to that gentleman that I gave my heart. Not for the Duc de Chateau again. There, in the moonlight, we were so close. Don't, please don't speak of it now. Mademoiselle, one day you drop a rose. I gave that rose back to you. I am that man to whom you gave your heart. I am not just names and shadows. I gave you back your rose. Now, are you going to ask me that I give you back your heart? Look at me, Mary. Will you come back to France with me and prove that I am not a mere name, but a man... The man you love? All my life I've smothered every feeling heaven ever sent me. And at last there comes one, one emotion that will not be smothered and kept down. I thought I could go on hating you. I might have if you hadn't come to see me here, when they're hunting you now through the park and everywhere. But I have seen you again. I've seen your soul. I don't care what you've done. I love you. You love an imposter. Tell me, Mary, say it. You're not an imposter. I love you. Then I can tell my secret. I am an imposter. No. But... No, you're not. You're you. My love. Now, oh, curse all intruders. Let me in. Let me in. It's Major Mullen. close the door. What is it, my friend? Lock it quickly. They know you are here. Someone saw you. They're coming this way now. We can escape. The side door. There'll be a carriage there. A carriage that will take us to the boat and then to France. Oh, oh quickly, please, while there's still time. Mademoiselle, have you reckoned all the costs? I love you. He will go to France with me. To the ends of the earth. Oh, Mary. Oh, I can't keep them out much longer. Hurry then, my lady. Through the other door and into the garden. I'll meet you there in ten minutes. But you... Do as I say quickly. The side door. I'll have the carriage. Wait. There, my friend. Didn't I tell you she was pure gold? I can't call them. Go out. And miss my appointment with Lord Winterfett? Oh, no. You're going to face them? My friend, face them. Now I can face the army of the English king. There he is. But of course. I'm sorry to be late, Captain Badger. Lord Winterset is waiting for you, Monsieur Barber. Will you come out into the garden, or must we drag you? Oh, I'll come gladly. This way, then. Uh, Major Molyneux, you are my second. Monsieur. You will see that fair play is done. It may be rather trying. Give up this mad scheme. Tell them who you are. Shh, shh, shh. Not a word, Major. No dueling, gentlemen. I beg you. Not There's here. There's a to be settled, sir. Yes. But not here. There will be a scandal. The French ambassador is on his way. Stand aside. Huh? Aha! My lord Winterset and his second. Good evening, gentlemen. Are you ready, barber? I've been looking forward to this meeting for a week. We are to use swords, of course. You expect me to fight a cutthroat barber with my bare hands? One doesn't expect Lord Winterset to fight at all, only to talk. Stand aside, let me through. Lady Mary. Go back to the carriage, my lady. This is no place for you. No. 
Cad, ma'am, do you remember who this man is? Quite well, it's Monsieur Bocquet. You see, my lord, there are times when even I have cards up my sleeve. On guard! At your service, monsieur. No, no! Gentlemen, put up your sword. Talk! The ambassador of his most Christian majesty, King Louis of France, the Marquis de Mirepoix. Ah, at a time like this. Your master, barber. Monsieur, monsieur, are you safe? My dear Marquis, you come to spoil a very good fight. Couldn't you have waited a little while? Monsieur, you need wear your disguise no longer. I, I know, I know. I have been forgiven again. We, oui. His Majesty King Louis. His has... Majesty King Louis has spoiled the only fight I ever had in my life. I shall never forgive him. Lord Winterset challenged me because I have been your hairdresser. My honor, gentlemen. I frowned against his mad humor, but he insisted. Who is he? One moment. Gentlemen, there is one thing I must ask of you. There is a man here who has forfeited his honor. He played cards with me and cheated. Then, on condition that I would not expose him, he introduced me at Lady Relaton's ball. He introduced me at the cost of his honor, then betrayed me to redeem it. That liar, that card cheat, that coward. He stands there, Monsieur le Duc de Winterset. By heaven, I'll know the real name of the man who dares bring such a charge. Uh, may I? I suppose you must. <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, permit me to have the honor to present to you His Royal Highness, Prince Louis-Philippe de Valois, Le Duc d'Orléans, Duc de Chartres, Duc de Nemours, Duc de Montcorbier, Comte de Beaujolais, First Prince of the Blood Royal, First Peer of France, Lieutenant General of French Infantry, Governor of Dauphiné, Knight of the Golden Fleece, Grand Master of the Order of Notre Dame, of Mount Carmel, of St. Lazarus in Jerusalem, and custody of His Most Christian Majesty, the King of France. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, what a memory he has. His Royal Highness, the Duc d'Orléans? The Duke of Orleans will hear from me within the hour. Monsieur. And whoever carries your message will receive a sound beating from my server. Uh, withdraw, please, gentlemen. This way. Lady Mary. Monseigneur, it's a terrible mistake I've made. Forgive me. Forgive? I? No, mademoiselle, it is you who must do the forgiving. I was an imposter. But if you could love an imposter, could you not love a prince? But you... Oh, it's impossible. Look at me, Mary. Your Highness, the ladies of the assembly are asking for a presentation to His Royal Highness, the Duc d'Orléans. The honor is his. But first I must introduce to all these people the lady who is to be his duchess. Duchess? That's only a name, Monseigneur. And I'm done with names. Save one. Monseigneur, present me by that name. The most beautiful in all the world, Mary. My Mary. Before Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy join us again, we'll have a word with Ray Jones of the new Universal Studios. Every motion picture requires three types of photographers. The cameraman and crew who film the story, the still man who takes the still picture of every individual scene, and the portrait photographer who shoots those off-screen photographs of your favorites that you see in the newspapers and magazines. Mr. Jones is one of the latter, an expert who, during almost a quarter of a century in Hollywood, has photographed the stars at six major studios. Yes, including Paramount, where I recall making 600 pictures for you and Cleopatra. I remember it particularly because 600 is about twice the number we usually take. Mr. DeMille is one of Hollywood's most ardent believers in still and portrait photography. Now, the title of portrait photographer explains itself. But as an ex-still man, Ray, why not a few details on that uh, phase of picture taking? For instance, why are so many still pictures never seen by the public? Many still pictures are made solely to help the director. Every set where a scene is shot, every costume, makeup, and hairdress of important players is photographed. This is to make certain that we'll know tomorrow exactly what the scene and actors look like today. It eliminates movie boners. For instance, in the road back at Universal, pictures were made of even the haircuts of all the leading male players. We turned these pictures over to the barber who cut their hair every three days to keep it at the same length. What about the 10-acre set Universal built for that picture? Oh, well, it's the largest standing set in Hollywood. It has 38 buildings, a public square, a battlefield, cathedral, and railroad station. Some of the other figures might also interest you. There are 10 miles of barbed wire out there and 80 cases of authentic furniture imported from Germany. There were seven weeks of night work, and the lighting was so powerful that airplanes reported seeing it 113 miles away. During the day, one man was kept at work doing nothing but watching clouds, 
So the shooting wouldn't be interrupted at a crucial point by the passing of a cloud before the sun. Well, getting back to portrait ray, what type of girl photographs best? A girl who has a smooth, soft complexion and a nice coat of suntan. Neither makeup nor photographic skill can take the place of a fine skin. A poor complexion calls for lots of makeup. And lots of makeup takes away the fine effects that we create through lighting. This is known by everyone in Hollywood. Particularly the stars whom I know use Lux toilet soap constantly to keep their complexions in perfect condition. I think I can speak for all the photographers in Hollywood in saying Lux soap has made our jobs a great deal easier and our result, results a lot finer. Women fall into four general complexion types. The very dark girl, the very light girl, the red-headed girl, and the suntan girl. She, as I said, is my favorite. She is the only type who can be photographed well without makeup. The best pictures you see will always be the ones that look the most natural. And now, my thanks to you all. Fine fade out, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Our stars shine again as we come now to a brief session with Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy. Thank you, C.B. You know, at least, I'm Mr. DeMille and I beg your pardon. I'm gone. I'm, I, that's <laughs> quite wrong. Mr. DeMille and I used to be neighbors. I rather miss being away. The DeMilles had a very nice tennis court, usually occupied by the Howards when the DeMilles wanted to play. <laughs> I'm taking it. Taking it by and large, you're a pretty good neighbor, Leslie. In spite of the temptations, you never once exercised your polo ponies on my front lawn. Oh, but I might have if I ever had a chance to play polo over here. That's something I usually must wait for till I get back to England. Keeping you busy, are they? Well, I'm too busy for polo. I've just finished a picture for Warner Brothers, and I'm just going to begin another for Walter Wanger. That one's called Standing. I'm, in that, I play the vice president of a bank. You know, I, I used to be a clerk in a bank once. That shows you what perseverance will do. And <laughs> And reminds me of a charming Lewis Carroll verse about a banker's clerk. He thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from the bus. He looked again and found it was a hippopotamus. <laughs> if this should stay to dine, he said, there won't be much for us. <laughs> <laughs> and I remind you of that, eh? That's <laughs> very flattering. <laughs> very touching. But I think Leslie's poetry in The Scarlet Pimpernel was much better. I'd heard you, you, you uh, talk about you doing a sequel to that picture. Uh, well, it's possible, Alice. I'm going back to England this summer to try my luck at being an actor-producer. We'll do either the sequel to The Pimpernel or a picture called Bonnie Prince Charlie. You know, playing in Monsieur Beaucaire tonight makes me think of England, too. I was just a little girl when I first saw the play in London and danced the minuet. That was long before I ever thought of becoming an actress. But I distinctly remember hoping that if I ever did become an actress, I'd have the chance to play Lady Mary. I always thought it was a charming part. So you see, wishes can come true, and once again, I'm indebted to that excellent Lux toilet soap. The last time you were here, Alyssa, you were hard at work on a play. Have you finished it? Yes, and I finished another novel, too. The play is set in Hollywood. Now all I have to do is to find a publisher for the novel. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Yeah, and if you find any publishers or not, hippopotamus or two, just think of us. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> to you, Mr. Howard and Miss Landy, our thanks. Mr. Howard appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers, Miss Landy, Metro Golden Mail, Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he is in charge of music for the new film, We Willy Winky. And here is Mr. DeMille. Next Monday night, the Lux Radio Theater presents what is probably the greatest, certainly the most exciting newspaper play ever written. The Front Page by Charles MacArthur and Ben Heck. The play brings to our stage one of the most remarkable gentlemen of our generation, a newspaper man who has brought a new style to journalism, a new idiom to the English language, and a new star to Hollywood, Walter Winchell. And starring with Mr. Winchell, Joan Bennett and James Gleason. One of the great news stories of the week, and one of the great enterprises of the age, is the round-the-world flight of Amelia Earhart. Tonight, Miss Earhart is in Java. And next Monday night, if she continues her flight on scheduled time, she will be here as our special guest in the Lux Radio Theater to tell you in person for the first time since her return something of her adventures on the trip. However, if Miss Earhart is delayed en route, she has graciously consented to keep her date with us here on July 5th. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Walter Winchell and Joan Bennett in the front page with James Gleason. And if possible, as special guest, Miss Amelia Earhart. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.